collaborative intelligence. So you know you, uh, you got asked like, oh, can you submit a talk? And then you're like, okay, what am I gonna talk about? You make up a fancy title and then it's two days before the event and you're like, why the hell was I thinking? So <laughs> bear with me. There's something about collaborative intelligence because I'm gonna talk about AI and uh, people and how that works, um, but yeah. But I think it's important. Um, I could give a great keynote on the future, which I don't know and never known. Um, but I feel what's really useful, at least how I learn, is when I look at the new technology, I'm trying to understand how it works. So instead of going off into a philosophical thing, will man be replaced by machines and automations and all that stuff? You've heard that before when the new kind of a, a while ago, all the automation scripts, uh, automate yourself away from a shell script, right? So I'm not gonna talk about that. Um, I'm just gonna try to make you understand how it works, and then you can make up your own mind. Who am I? Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna show some code, um, and I hope you can read it at the back. If not, shout. Um, there's a repo that contains the code. It's basically a set of samples of lessons I create for people to, with a DevSecOps background to understand how this new AI, Gen AI thing works. Um, I'm going to not use uh, the APIs directly. I'm going to use a framework. There's plenty of them. There's a, these are a few of them, depending on your preference. I'm going to use Langchain as uh, the framework in the examples. Right, so I'm now going to switch over to code. Can you read this in the back? All right, mission accomplished. So, Langchain. Um, ecosystem typically came from data science, Gen AI makes sense. There's a lot of Python now these days, it's gonna evolve, but I assume one way or another as a system administrator, maybe you've played around with Python, but the examples are not like the hardest code to understand and I'm not the best coder either, so I like simplicity in there. Um, so we'll just install Langchain. Langchain and for the examples, I'm using, gonna use OpenAI. Uh, you can use any of the models or servers or cloud providers, it is just to keep it simple for people to try out at home as well. All right, you got the first installation going. Of course, I'm not going to show you my keys and load it into an environment variable, blah, 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 blah. All right. Okay, first example. Is this zoomed in enough or should I zoom in more? Okay, good. All right. So you're familiar with ChatGPT, so um, I'm just gonna ask the simple question. I'm gonna load the library, open AI, and I'm gonna ask it, where is Ghent? And of course, it answers me pretty simple. Ghent is located in Flemish region. All good, pretty easy. Now, let's ask this six times. And as you notice, it gives different answers, right? And it's the first thing you would not expect. Uh, think of it as a large language model, model like GPT, like your bash completion. It's just trying to predict what is next, but instead of having its dictionary, it uses the internet. And of course, you know, some things are gonna give it a different answer. So one important concept of this is that you want to make it predictable. Sometimes you want it to be more creative if you're making things up. Sometimes you want to make it predictable. And to make these calls predictable, we use something called a parameter called temperature. And the temperature zero means it is very predictable and should always give the same kind of result. And as you see now, when I set the uh, the temperature to zero is always going to give the same result, right? So we learn a model, we're just going to call it, and we set the temperature. And then some of the models 
give results back, right? I'm not gonna, I'm not able to show this. Some will show you only immediately the complete result, and others are able to stream the result. So you see sometimes that it's being generated. That is because it works that way, right? It's not instantly has the answer. Think of it as constantly adapting what is the next character it should go. So in our case, we can pull off a parameter, streaming is true, and then it is just being streamed. The text that I send over to the um, LLM is what you would typically type in ChatGPT. But there is a limit of what you can type in that buffer. And sometimes that is called the, not sometimes, it's called the context size. So think of it as I'm providing the model, the LLM with the context, and it has a certain size. There's going to be smaller ones, there's going to be buffers up until 100k, but you have to know how big your model is responding to. So in this case, it has a context size of 4096. And it has a maximum tokens, and tokens think of it as parts of words that it uses to generate the next part uh, in there. Everybody good? All right. So, <clears throat> you wrote the first thing, where is Gantt? And sometimes you want to see what goes under the hood. And that's the important part. We all know frameworks, they like to abstract things away, but I like to learn these things. So I enable debug and see how it goes. So this is a simple output of something that goes over the wire. Notice that it's like just text. There's nothing else going on. It is text with an answer. I got like a, a lot more information. Um, I can enable more debug flags, but you will see me in these examples. I have a callback handler, which is hooks into the internals of Langchain and reports when an LLM is doing something, uh, is being generated. So you see, oh, a new token, where is Gantt, is being generated, and then it is the end. Right? This is just that you understand that is a way of debugging things and to see what goes over the wire. Up until now, I've used um, just one request. But you know, typically you do request, answer, request, answer. You're in a chat mode. So for that, we select a chat model. They're different than the other models, which are more like instruct models, they kind of give you question answer. Chat kind of enables you to have that conversation. So what's useful to know there? Um, if I'm sending just a question to um, ChatGPT, sometimes I want to um, kind of provide a bit of initial context. So in this case, I'm telling it you are a helpful system that translates English to French. Right? So uh, that is called a system prompt. And then I send it my question, typically a human uh, message. I love programming. And then lo and behold, j'adore la programmation. Parfait. <laughs> right. So um, you can use this in your co-pilot. Imagine you're an expert developer in blah. It will set the tone you get a different answer if you don't do this. So it's, it's kind of like, uh, it's not doing anything magical, it's still text, but it kind of sets the context, right? So the word context is pretty important. So this is the difference between kind of one kind of question and a chat going on. And of course, I can build on more of those messages, right? This time, we're going to have it generate jokes. Uh, instead of having just text going in, very similar to um, templating, you want to have a template that we can set parameters and send it over. So in this case, my prompt template is, tell me, adjective, joke about content, and I can pass along funny and chickens and it tell me, tell me a funny joke about chickens. 
So it generates the prompt based on a template and with some kind of parameters. And then obviously, why did the chickens go to the SaaS to talk to the other side of the road? And like Deshaun said, we have to be careful when we cross the road. Um, so this kind of allows you to think about a template that you're reusing over and over again, and you just have it parameterized. Um, also think about this, how this will work with kind of injection of things, but we'll get there to later. So very simple thing, I can kind of have a conversation that goes in templating. So notice I'm, I'm doing a lot of boilerplate, but kind of gets you in the set of different models, a template, sending things over, uh, and that is everything you could do typically in a chat GPT. So chat GPT only knows what is in the model. And one of the things you want to do is you want to bring in your own knowledge, something the internet doesn't know, something that is, was done later after the model was built. So in this case, what I will do is I'm just going to load a simple markdown file. And what's in there, it is just a history lesson about DevOps, blah, 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 uh, what happened there. Okay. Um, instead of it loading it as a text, I can obviously use a better parser and I can use a markdown loader. And I can use a whole bunch of files and read them in. And I can even load a website or anything, any data source you're getting. Right? So there's loaders in those frameworks to get it from your SQL database to your data dog logs to wherever. You're just going to pull in data that you wanted that the internet doesn't know. And then you can use that in your prompt to kind of answer questions. Now, what we really want to do is we want to create a prompt that says, given this information, given this question, answer me this. It is just text. There's nothing special about this. But the thing is, how do you get it to say, like, this information? So what do you do if you're looking for information on the internet? You do a search. You do a query. You look up your database with a wiki or wherever. So we're doing something similar. We're just going to do a search. The problem is if, not a problem, you can use any traditional search uh, mechanism like a database or your kind of typical keyword indexer. But there's a new kid on the block, which is semantic search. And semantic search doesn't use keywords, but it looks for semantic similar meanings. So um, even the words are not similar. In a way, um, kind of any of the config management tools, they're related, but they will not match if I search for one of them on a keyword, but they will match on semantic meaning as being related to being a config uh, management tool. So next to having your data, you want to have it indexed using an embedding. And an embedding, it's a mathematical model, mathematical model, but you don't really need to know how it exactly works. Think of it as an indexer that um, calculates a vector, and if there's a piece of information here, it's a piece of information there, if the two are related, the vector will be very closely related. So if we can calculate the vector difference, and if it's close, then we know the documents are related. So if I have a question, and I, if I look up what is related to that question in my database, in my documents, and all my stuff, I will find the pieces that uh, I will put in my prompt. So that's kind of how it works. A vector is just a bunch of numbers. But um, there's now a service, much like a search indexer, which is a vector store you will hear about. This is where you store all the documents with the index. So I can query it like a database, a search, a semantic indexer, which is a vector store. But 
when I put those documents in, if I have a very long document, it's, what is the meaning? If one paragraph is about one piece, and another one is about another piece of information, if I do the meaning of the whole document, it will be different than when I split that off in multiple parts. So when I have my um, markdown file, I'm just gonna split, um, you can split naively by saying every 100 characters is a piece of information, but I can do it more intelligently by saying I'm gonna split it by header. So I have paragraphs I'm gonna index on those parts. And that gives you a better relationship um, of those pieces. I know it's a little bit abstract, but we're getting there. Hang on. So I got the documents. I'm kind of chunking them and splitting them up into the pieces I need. I've indexed those pieces into my vector store. And now I can do a search for this. So in this case, I'm using Chroma DB. Uh, where I am kind of uh, first, I'm going to index all the documents that I read and I'm going to store them in my vector store. Now, I can find the related documents based on the query I use. So this is not necessarily needed, but if you're dealing with unstructured text like PDFs, or Word documents or wikis, this gives a lot better results than your keyword search. So that's why we're doing this. So now, how do we make use of that? We connect to the existing database uh, that we populated with all our information. And we're using a retrieval uh, thing. So we're, um, what, I will show you what it does. Um, who were the people involved in writing the DevOps handbook? Right? Return the results as a JSON and using the first field and last name. I'm first going to do the query based on the internet information, um, like we did in the very simple query. And it's, it's telling us there's four people that have written that book. Now, we're gonna augment that information with our own markdown file, with our own information, and then ask that question again. So when we ask it, and I'll have to open this, it adds another author, John Alspaugh. And that is because we've put that own information in our prompt when we did the query to the database. So this is how, um, when you see the new AI about documentation or indexing or search, this is how it works, right? So we fetch the data, we cut it up, we put it in an index, and then when somebody asks a question, we look up the related information, we put it in the prompt, and then we do the query. There's no rocket science here, there's nothing special over the wire, it's sending text, nothing more than text. But we can get fancy with that mechanism and say, I have open API docs somewhere. So I'm going to use it to say, split up the documentation of the open API spec, index it, when I do a query, look up the pieces that you need in that documentation, and then try to figure out what the query is. And in this case, it uses the open uh, API spec from a Meteo uh, weather service. And as you see, you are given the below API information. Here's the information that we got from the API documentation. Um, and use this to answer the question. And you can see that it's um, kind of constructed the URL that it's supposed to use to do that query. So you see, we've enhanced 
whatever was on the internet with our own information, this time not with our wiki, but with our API spec, and it just was able to do a call on the internet. Personally, I found that pretty cool, right? And that is also, you know, a good cause of writing documentation. Now it's actually being used by somebody. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, what if we go further and we say, not instead of just um, kind of enhancing uh, our calls with um, what um, we find in our own information or what was indexed in the model, what if we just allow it to call out to the internet? It's a different source of information that is being able to, uh, to find. So in this case, I'm using DuckDuckGo service. I'm using this to query, um, and it, you know, when I query it, it will just give me a result. But I can start building an agent with a set of tools. And in this case, I'm providing it a tool and say, here's a searcher, and use this for when you need to answer questions. Note that I, I did not programming, programming um, or instruct the model more than just a description of how to use it. So how would this look like under the hood? Um, I'm just gonna skip that part. So on the text level, you see this is the prompt that goes over the wire. Answer the following question as best as you can. Um, you have access to the following tools. There is a tool called DuckDuckGo search with the description of the tool and it explains how the format goes on and then begin with your question. So I've now blended a model with a set of tools. It figured out how to kind of put them all together into a prompt uh, and just send that text over the wire and give me a result. And then it, it goes on, uh, are you sure you need a tool? Or are you not sure you need a tool? So it's having that whole chat conversation and then eventually it finishes with saying the weather in London is like that. So this is something that is with it. just a model isn't, doesn't work. Just providing it with information with, on your own doesn't work. But now I provided it with a tool that it's uh, using when it uh, kind of uh, expect that it needs it. This is also how you solve a model uh, that you ask like, what is a four plus four? A model would just guess on a probability. Maybe it found the answer somewhere and you know, kind of had it right, or it gets it wrong. But if I get a model, a set of tools, like a calculator, it can see like, oh, to add numbers, here's a tool that's very good at adding numbers. And it sends that over the wire, and then that triggers your code of the calculation. Stepping up our game, what if we just have a bunch of those agents that work together? One is, in this case, a senior analyst. One is a tech content strategist. And then another one um, knows a lot about AI advancements. And you give it a task to find an, uh, like a full analytic report. So each of them goes on to the internet and says like, okay, I'm gonna do a search on AI 2024. Then they come back, this is the information. Then they have another one chatting with it. Like, what do you think? Was it a good idea? Was it not a good idea? Um, and it keeps it in a loop. So this is how you would maybe uh, construct something like, no, here's an incident. What should we do about incident? Oh, there's an expert in incident recovery, there's a cloud expert, uh, there's an expert at uh, giving pizzas away or something, right? And they all kind of work together during your incident and make that. So this is the style of automation that we're looking at beyond the simple prompt. And to close off kind of like the leading up to the next thing is this was just text. The new models are able to do vision, right? So I can feed it 
an image of a hot dog, right? And then when I ask it what's in the image, it's gonna tell me a hot dog with ketchup and mustard, right? But imagine I have a screenshot. What are all the areas that I can click on in this screenshot and list them in a table together, you know, with a name, description, and their coordinates? So then I have an agent that has a tool that can reason about what it sees on my desktop and is able to click on stuff. Um, in this case, I took the home page and it just kind of got all the links where it could click. It didn't even look at the HTML. Um, and then I noticed also that social is spelled with two O's, which I would, <laughs> would have never have noticed. Um, but this is the way, you know, kind of like, think about how your desktop is also being monitored and not uh, anything that goes uh, on there. So I, I hope that gives you a little bit from the basic to the power, and I know this is a, uh, you know, a very fast one, but it's also not like complex code. It's not that I have to code like for hours and hours to do that, um, to get a working. All right, let's see. So, I'll switch back to my slides. And one of the things you notice is that, oh, how do we solve this problem here? Oh, let's use more AI, let's add more data, let's add more tools. And it's kind of like the spiraling of you feeding the machine to make sure it does what it's supposed to do. Uh, so when is enough? Some people think, you know, it will just work. Others, they think, oh, we'll never get there. It will never be correct. Um, but it is something that we're just going to keep going. And like I mentioned, it's not because I think it's not going to happen that not somebody else will come up with the ID or try. Uh, there's tools that will start monitoring your desktop they record every screen capture of anything or you clicked on. You, your teammate, the whole company also has data collecting your knowledge. And then by putting your images to text, you can remember things nobody knew or the guy that left kind of only knew and bring that in. Of course, there's a new set of privacy problems. So we use more AI <laughs> to scrub anything that should not be recorded on our screens. The big side. <laughs> um, and there's this drive about building the tools that build the tools, and we all know where kind of that ends, like because premature optimization is evil. Uh, but there's some truth to this that we're trying to get better at certain tools. And finding the information that you have on your wiki that you will not be able to find or assist you in your daily job, that's huge winch. And I would say that kind of pattern of augmenting your data, retrieval augmented generation, is the pattern of 2023. All companies that you will see have been started on that journey. The code execution part and the vision part, everybody's continuing to explore that in 2024. So that's where we're at. Obviously, you're a system administrator, so how does it help me? <laughs> well, you could copy and paste things in ChatGPT, get your code, um, and have it help you and assist you find your uh, information. But what about you as a vendor? Why are you not supplying an index to all your information that is readily queryable, that's consumable by these tools, and that people can just uh, kind of uh, index or have their AI tools used. What was that? I don't know. That was AI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. OK, so Open Interpreter um, is kind of, we give it a tool and just say, here's a Linux box. Try to solve the problem. I don't care how it works. Just figure it out. So here's a little capture of me yesterday evening. Install FFmpeg using Ansible. And anything that is suggested by the LLM in Markdown, it just 
starts executing this. Okay, it took me probably six tries to make something usable. Uh, the first one, it was stuck at sudo, sudo. What do I mean, sudo? <laughs> the next one was um, it couldn't figure out what to do in writing a config file because it always had the bash quotes missing. Um, so I already gave it a few instructions. I said, well, don't use sudo, your root, which is the system prompt. Um, and then I said to it, um, use Python to generate your config because then you don't have a problem with your quotes. Um, it still got it wrong because then it started installing after a while FFmpeg directly because it basically gave up on Ansible there. <laughs> um, but <laughs> but this one finally worked. It installed it. I was able to get it. So is it working? This one was still just using the internet knowledge. Imagine we just augment this with our own set of tools, it's able to verify whatever goes on on the machine. We enhance it with the documentation about that it's need to be done. We enhance it with our own notes, you know, kind of notes.txt that we all keep or whatever. Um, and that could give a better result. But it just gets you into the ID. Uh, I have another example about while I was doing this all manually with the assistant, and then I wrote it like I said afterwards, like whatever I did right now, can you write me a puppet manifest? And it did, right? So it's, we're also teaching it in a way that it can help us do the manual exploration work. Would I trust it right now? Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> right? So you see the evolution is going. We don't know where we're ending up, but it's definitely an interesting journey. So this was my short summary, and uh, I have a lot more in depth, and you can look at the repo. This is like how Gen AI can start helping DevOps and note that I didn't put the copilot thing and ask for snippets because that's so 2022. <laughs> but there's a flip side to it, like, okay, um, building all this new AI, Gen AI stuff, the unpredictable nature, the chaos, the tools, the security, something we're very good at, right? So we can, whatever you're building in your company or other people are building, we can bring a ton of value to come in. And I'm predicting that this is coming to your platform team. Um, I know the term is loaded with a lot of things, but in my um, head, there is, part of the platform team is cloud, then it's a layer higher, which is the application platform, and then there's also going to be a data platform and an AI platform. And they're all kind of about governance and shared components that you want to roll out to the rest of your organization. So I would advise you to start paying attention, understand the basics, and also understand what's coming at you. First thing is developer experience, prototyping. So how do I do this in my org? How do I get access to my data? It's something you can help each of the teams with and probably need some standardization there as well. Some term you will hear, it's not just about the prompt, but you say it's like a flow. First something A, then B, and a query. So look at like other ways of dealing with this, visualizing that stuff. And then there's debugging, because I do one prompt, a call, another call, another call, and so I want to have this debugging way of seeing like what went over the wire. Much as we've shown, it's like the traceability. We, we know for applications and API calls, we need something similar for uh, this kind of prompting and calling. You want to have some local models, like you have a local development stack. Knock yourself out. Um, it works on a laptop. Obviously, you don't get the same quality, but it is good to do a lot of uh, coding. Um, the models that are being created, probably you want to have a registry or you want to use one of the open model registries. It's like who gets access to what, what is vetted. It's think of it as a container. You pull it in, you pull it out. This is similar. Like there's going to be some governance happening there as well. The prompts, one team reusing the prompt from another team, from another team, business logic specifics. 
there's public prompts registry, likely you'll have a prompt registry also in your company that people are, think of it as your you know, Git repository, your prompt repository, your model registry. So they're all gonna be similarly. And that pattern that I, uh, I shown you of bringing your own data, it's also gonna be a service. RAG as a service, right? Um, this is Amazon Q that have all those connectors, all that chunking, it's just gonna be a service I've just shown you to make it you understand how it goes a little bit under the hood, but that is just something teams will start using um, as a service, and you better understand how the implications are for security, getting data in there as well. Agents as a service, even though it's far away, the vendors are providing the tools, and maybe they're simple case, so, even though the technology is not that mature, maybe for smaller things, it can already help. And then how to unify it? Like, oh, should I go with Azure? Or should I go with um, kind of the, the bedrock from AWS, the Google, uh, run my own? So what people are looking for is a unified interface, much like S3. In this case, it might be that we're all ending up being the open AI, uh, API, but it's like a, a front that we expose all this uh, information to, to like an abstraction, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel of adapting when there is a new model coming around. And then guardrails as a service, uh, I often refer to this as the web application firewall, um, but for what goes in and out of the prompt. So guardrails as a service, um, it exists uh, on every of the cloud vendors uh, where you can say, oh, this is uh, the quality, um, is it sexual loader, is it self-harm, it could be PII. Uh, so typically you could have central rules, you can have team rules, you can have application rules, but that's something that will likely be coming um, as a service as well. Observability is how do we deal with any of those changes in prod? Uh, that traceability that I've shown you, um, instead of just doing a health check on an API, is it ready, is it working, yes, no, you send in a set of prompts with an expected result and see if that's still within acceptable limits. So that's kind of the monitoring observability that you do. And then obviously this is important because in your test cases, you cannot predict all the things people are putting in there so you need feedback as a service to feedback more test data, to feedback more information to the people building the prompts and building the applications. All the services that I've mentioned, um, most of the companies I've known have been cobbled, have cobbled this together, DIY, uh, kind of last year, but you know, many things here are instant legacy. <laughs> and you'll, you'll have to migrate to one of the vendors there uh, as well. So this has been a, kind of a short talk. I hope it was a good balance between thinking ahead and a little bit of the code. Understand it's, uh, it's not something 9 a.m. in the morning, although it was already 9.30. Um, so if you need some help, you have some ideas, you're, you're passionate about this stuff, I certainly am, um, contact me. Um, and finally, I want to say um, this is an integration great game, right? I have not had to do any weird math or have a major in that I can just make things work. We are so used to dealing with uncertainty in production. We have so much experience to making things bend to what we want. Um, so this is something you are very good at and I encourage you to kind of explore the technology uh, and get closer to your teams uh, and learn from them, but also uh, help them with all your knowledge. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nee, nee, toch helemaal.
start discussing Italian dishes. Um, 